I know I say this all the time and I'm definitely gonna catch crap about it in the comments section, but I promise you this time I mean it. The noise marines are by far one of my favorite things in all of Warhammer 40K. And I mean, honestly, how could they not be? How could you not immediately fall in love with these guys? They're what would happen if you took a coked up hair metal rocker from the 80s and turned them into a space marine. They're basically what would happen if Dr. Roxo somehow managed to get a full suit of power armor. But as ridiculous and bombastic as that concept is, a group of space marines that kills their enemies with the power of rock and roll, there's a lot more to them than that. And don't get me wrong, I'm a massive horror fan. I love all things spooky and grimdark. But after having spent a week diving down the noise marine rabbit hole in order to research this video, I, I gotta say, their lore is pretty f***ing disturbing. But what exactly are the Noise Marines? What are they all about? Where did they come from and what is their purpose? Is a gun that literally fires projectiles made out of noise an effective weapon? And if so, what are these things truly capable of? What's the story behind that one crazy demonic concert that caused everyone in attendance to go batshit insane and was supposedly part of their origin? And most importantly, do they actually fight with guitars? Is that a real thing? Because there seems to be a disconnect between the artwork and the models in the tabletop game. Well, today we're gonna be getting to the bottom of that and a whole lot more. But before we get started, you may have noticed there's no sponsor on this video. And that's because I'm doing it. I'm sponsoring my own video. And that's because I just launched my very own merch store. And to celebrate it, I commissioned this amazing Noise Marine Band t-shirt designed by the legendary Nemons themselves. It features one of the Dark God of Excess's most honored servants as they spread enlightenment to the masses through the power of rock and roll. Join the Noise Marines as they tour the galaxy, starting with their first performance on Istvan and wrapping up with a final show at the Imperial Palace on Terra. You can pick up one of these amazing band tees for yourself today and let everyone know that you're a person of refined taste and that you only listen to noise of the truest quality. If you want to support the channel and all the work that I do, then click on the link in the description of this video or go to westhammer.com and navigate over to the shop tab. There you can pick up one of these amazing shirts for yourself and be quick because realistically, they're probably not going to be available forever. Again, click on the link in the description of this video or go to westhammer.com today to pick up one of these shirts and help support me and the channel. Okay, with that out of the way, let's dive headfirst into the grimdark. Within the grim darkness of the 42nd millennium, there is perhaps none that better stand as a testament to the corrupting power of chaos more so than the Noise Marines, depraved and decadent warriors that fight in the name of Slanesh, the Dark Prince of Pleasure. Individuals will become corrupted beyond mortal comprehension and take a perverse delight in slaughter. Everything about them is designed to invoke the extreme, from their armor that is often saturated in conflicting patterns of sickeningly bright colors to their terrifying self-inflicted mutilations that can range from mouths that have been replaced with Vox speakers, eyes that have been permanently stitched open, or ears that have been augmented to amplify the volume of everything they hear to mind-shattering levels. They are as ludicrous as they are horrifying to behold. These are individuals that are so addicted to excess that they can only register sensation when it is pushed to its most extreme. Only the most intense colors, sounds, sights, and smells bring them any form of pleasure. They've even gone as far as undergoing a number of bizarre surgeries to replace many of their sensory organs with hellish alien devices that are designed to crank those sensations up to even more ludicrous levels. They are traditionally members of the Emperor's Children, a once noble and proud legion that prided itself on its pursuit to perfection. Now these once stalwart defenders of mankind have become little more than frothing addicts, cruel psychopaths that are trapped in a never-ending downward spiral of debauchery, cursed to forever seek out more extreme levels of excess. And needless to say, for the Noise Marines, the line between pain and pleasure has been obliterated. To them, art is only beautiful when it is physically painful to look at, music only pleasurable when its volume causes blood to leak from your ears, and war only worth fighting when its victims are subjected to incalculable levels of exquisite suffering. The Noise Marines march to war to the deafening tune of disturbing chaotic instruments that lambast the enemy with a song so horrifying it can sunder reality and fracture minds. Their armor and vehicles are covered in bizarre amplification devices, Vox systems and microphones that blast the sound of creation itself. 
To hear this Song of Slanesh is to hear infinite orchestras playing on top of each other. It is to hear the birth of the universe, the dying of suns, and the slaughter of entire worlds condensed into one horrifying frequency. They wield a host of sonic weaponry, bizarre creations that are more instrument than firearm. The resonating frequencies they generate can detonate hordes of charging infantry into nothing less than red mist. Every unholy note echoing forth to rupture organs, shatter minds, and pulverize every bone in the enemy's body. When their wielder fine tunes those frequencies, they are even capable of blasting open fortress gates or causing armored vehicles to detonate. Through a chorus of noise marines, the battlefield is like a grand orchestra, a symphony of pain and suffering. The staccato of bolter shells detonating, the percussion of artillery laying waste to the enemy, the screams of the dying, and the music of war in all its horrifying beauty build to an explosive crescendo that electrifies their hedonistic minds. Nothing less than sonic enlightenment bellows forth from this unholy choir as every note and chord causes a cascading string of gory explosions as the unworthy are subjected to the overwhelming power of the voice of the gods themselves. This is their purpose, their reason for living, and they will continue to plague our galaxy in their never-ending quest for new sounds, notes, and harmonies to add to their song, their ballad of excess, and their tribute to Slanesh. So with that tastefully dramatic intro out of the way, what exactly is a noise marine? Well, in the simplest terms, a noise marine is a chaos space marine traditionally from, but not limited to, the Emperor's Children Legion that, through the worship of Slanesh, has become addicted to auditory extremes and tends to fight with sonic weaponry. They are sickening and grotesque figures that exist as a combination of warp-borne mutation and experimental surgery that is designed to allow the marine to experience sensations on vastly more extreme levels than their loyalist counterparts. It should be noted that all followers of Slanesh are addicted to extreme levels of excess in one way, shape, or form, be that food, drugs, sex, violence, or any of the other infinite vices that plague humanity. For the Noise Marines, this comes in the form of a particular obsession with sound. To the chaos-addicted mind, things that were once pleasurable will quickly become stale, leading the individual to seek out ever more intense highs. The Noise Marines are this concept taken to an extreme level. Even the most objectively beautiful music doesn't even register to them. Instead, the Noise Marine lusts after more intense and disturbing sounds, such as the cacophony of battle, the screams of the dying, or frequencies of such intense magnitude they cause eardrums to burst and sanity to shatter. It is their curse to scour the universe for such sounds, and whenever they happen to find them, the unfortunate truth is that they will quickly become accustomed to them and need to seek out ever-increasing levels of extreme noise to feel that pleasure they are addicted to. Being monstrous noise addicts whose primary reason for existing is to continue to seek out new highs means that they are inherently selfish, even more so than what is considered standard fare for most of the followers of Chaos. Like most of the Chaos Legions, the Emperor's children have been shattered and do not exist as a unified force, instead existing as a host of hundreds of different competing warbands, all with their own goals and objectives. The noise Marines often fill out the ranks of these warbands, but they have been documented fighting alongside Marines of other Legions as well. The only commonality amongst all of them is that they are worshippers of Slanesh and only Slanesh. You're never going to see a Nurgle, Korn, or Zinch noise Marine, but honestly, that would probably be pretty cool. I wonder what that would even look like. Most of the time when you see them acting as a singular force, they are normally pursuing some bizarre esoteric objective deemed important only by the Noise Marines. Or more commonly, they are acting as a type of mercenary group following a particularly arrogant or foolish warlord that believes that they can control them. Normally the warlord in question has managed to procure their services by promising them some form of auditory compensation. This can come in the form of promising them a piece of ancient Xenos Archaeotech, whose process of operation creates a horrific audio byproduct that the Noise Marines find particularly pleasing. Or, as is more often the case, is simply the promise of a particularly loud and bombastic battle. They are notoriously unpredictable, and their allegiance can change on a whim if another force or leader figure presents themselves that can offer them more access to extreme noise. There was one particularly sadistic group of noise marines known as the Choir of Aberrants that existed within an area of space plagued by a permanent warp storm known as the Screaming Vortex. 
These guys would routinely capture entire hosts of slaves from the unsuspecting populations of local planets and then fit them with an array of sonic amplifiers and Vox speakers. They would then chain them up and drag groups of 20 to 30 of them per noise marine into battle. The devices that they had been implemented with were torturous in nature and would constantly subject their hosts to untold levels of agony, eliciting a cacophony of pain shouts and cries that would then be amplified a hundredfold through the Vox systems to skull-shattering levels of intensity. The choir suffering not only excited the noise marines into a battle-ready fugue state, but their dreadful music was also used as a devastating weapon. Because they exist in such a fractured state and their interests are so varied, it's difficult to nail down any form of commonplace tactics that the noise marines tend to use. Some of them prefer utilizing fast-moving vehicles, bikes, or jump packs, their addiction to battle compelling them to get to the killing as fast as possible, whereas others may prefer the good old-fashioned ground-pounding approach, savoring every exhilarating, murderous step they take towards their quarry. The slow, mounting dread of their approach and the anticipation of the coming slaughter being something that must be savored to be truly appreciated. After all, a delight postponed is a delight doubled. Their bodies have mutated in such a way that makes each and every one of them a particularly frightening combatant, as well as a tactical asset if they can be controlled. At first and foremost, they are ridiculously durable, as every wound that is inflicted upon them is viewed as a gift. Pain and suffering is like a drug to them. It electrifies their senses in a way reminiscent of the constant flow of narcotics and combat stems that are continuously being pumped into their bloodstream through a delivery system built into their armor. I mean, just thinking about it, how do you fight against something like that? How do you combat an enemy that every time you land a blow, any damage you inflict does little more than push them into orgasmic bliss? The longer the fight goes on, the more tired your limbs get, the heavier the weapons you wield begin to feel. Well, simultaneously, your enemy continues to grow faster, stronger, and more deranged. Their movements become more erratic and their mind more fixated on killing you in increasingly elaborate, grotesque, and perverted ways. It's quite literally like they are horny for battle, and that combined with their frightful appearance can create an incredibly demoralizing effect on enemy forces that have not been conditioned to fight against such grotesque creatures. Now, admittedly, everything I just said could technically apply to fighting any of the followers of Slanesh, but what makes the Noise Marines different is their specialized addiction that gives them some pretty unique properties. First and foremost, their hearing has vastly exceeded even the superhuman levels of auditory processing that all Space Marines are capable of. They can hear a pin drop from a mile away, while also hearing the heartbeats of any enemies waiting in ambush. If you manage to sneak up on a Noise Marine, it's only because they let you. When it comes to the weapons they bear in combat, Noise Marines have access to the same armory that the other forces of Chaos do. It's not uncommon for them to wield bolters, power swords, lightning claws, or any of the more generalized equipment of Chaos Astartes. More melee-focused Noise Marines may take a particular delight in the crackling sound the lightning claws make, or mayhaps the hissing sound of blood boiling off an ignited power blade is what really does it for them. Each and every one of them is unique in their own depravity. It is, however, their sonic-based weaponry that is the most iconic thing about the Noise Marines, so that's what we're going to focus on in this section. They come in a lot of different forms, as they've had thousands of years to pursue an unlimited spectrum of audible deviancy, but there are definitely three that stand above the rest. That is the Sonic Blaster, the Doom Siren, and the Blast Master. The Sonic Blaster is the most common of which, and is played more like an instrument as opposed to how someone would normally operate a firearm. The wielder plays it by running up and down through all of its various chords and sliding scales in order to loose a perpetual howl of agony and ecstasy. It is a heavy weapon that is capable of fully automatic fire and sends waves of devastating harmonics that rip all those in its line of fire apart at a molecular level. It is roughly equivalent in size and function to that of a heavy bolter, although there have been some reports of larger twin-linked versions that have been equipped on Sonic Dreadnoughts. Whereas the Sonic Blaster is most efficient against infantry, the Blastmaster is a Noise Marine's answer to heavily armored targets. Instead of relying on sliding rifts and scales, the Blastmaster produces a singular throbbing bass note that builds into an explosive crescendo that is powerful enough to burst eyeballs and rupture organs. In fact, if the note is maintained for an extended duration, the intensity can reach a point where it is powerful enough to crumble fortress gates and shatter the armored paneling of tanks. 
Although the primary purpose of the Blastmaster is to deal with armor, it does have a setting that it can switch to that allows its user to fire off short discordant riffs, rather than a long drawn out singular pulse, and thus it can be fired on the move. However, due to how the weapon works, it is much less effective in this setting, and the preferred method of its users is to fight as a dedicated heavy weapons team. The Doom Siren, on the other hand, doesn't even attempt to mimic a traditional firearm, instead existing as an arrangement of pipes and tubes that connect to the Noise Marine's helmet. This allows the Marine to issue war cries or howls of pain and pleasure, and convert them into a short-range shockwave of destruction that radiates out from a series of demon-faced Vox emitters mounted on the bearer's shoulders. The beauty of this weapon is that it leaves the wielder's hands free to carry other weapons or perform other tasks, and is often reserved for the most esteemed champions of noise such as the unit's choir master. There is a much larger version of the Doom Siren known as a Dirge Caster, but it is traditionally mounted on Slaneshi aligned vehicles and demon engines. Their range is substantially increased, and the non-stop litany of discordant sonic chaos they unleash works to sow chaos within the enemy ranks, as its utterly incomprehensible wails and shrieks work to drive the undisciplined mind into madness. To those who have been fine-tuned to the Song of Slaanesh, the device has the exact opposite effect, amplifying their abilities and whipping them up into an ecstatic kill frenzy. In a similar vein, the vehicle-mounted warp amplifiers exist as a series of amplifiers, speakers, and bizarre demonic instruments that work by channeling the energy of the warp into sounds specifically designed to amplify emotion. The closer the enemy gets to the vehicle, the weaker their morale becomes. Eventually, minds break and sanity fractures, as weak-willed individuals are forced to give in to their darkest temptations, often becoming hostile to their own allies. This keeps the vehicle and all allied infantry in its vicinity safe from incoming assaults. The thing to understand about a Noise Marine's ability and weapons is that their damage is as much physical as it is psychic in nature. Thus, cover is all but useless against them. The target doesn't even need to technically be able to hear it and they've even been documented as being able to work within the vacuum of space. There's a great depiction of what the Noise Marines and their sonic weaponry is capable of in the novel The Path of Heaven by Chris Wright, wherein a cacophony of early Noise Marines are deployed against the White Scars. Purple and gold warriors strode from the heart of the unnatural storm, moving purposefully and without haste, slowly fanning out, making no attempt to avoid the ranks of armor, grinding their way to their positions. The newcomers bore the ancient livery of Chemos, though in more ornate patterns than their tactical brethren, and their plate shimmered from the wretch-inducing stink of the warp. Each warrior held a pendulous organ gun, shackled by linked chains and glistening cables. As one, the Baroque mutants of the Cacophony reached their allotted positions, lowered the muzzles of their devices, picked their targets, and fired. What emerged did not deserve the name Sound. There were no words in the tongues of mortal men adequate to describe what could now be unleashed by Fulgrim's disciples, for the instruments of hypersensation created more than just auditory hell. Acting in concert, mass sonic blasts smeared across the artificial atmosphere of the Void Port and reality distorting waves of molecular annihilation. The advancing 5th Legion Outrider squads were thrown back, flung clear of the exploding cover all around them. Troops too close were obliterated instantly, disappearing in spiraling worlds of blood and armor flex. Landing plates cracked, tilting crazily as grav compensators whined, straining to fight the terrifying forces raging across them. Advancing armor formations shuddered to a halt, lodging amid what shelter remained and launching everything they had at the cacophony spearhead. The second wave tactical squads advanced behind the uncertain tank cover, their helms automatically dampening the mutilating levels of distortion washing over the battlefield. Even that was not enough when the sonic weapon scored direct hits, in which case power armor was ripped clean apart, warriors stunned in a bloody coma even as their helm lenses imploded and internal organs ruptured. Lord Commander Eidolon, the proudest of his proud breed, turned his pitiless helm across the ruined detritus of the tank advance opened his agonized throat, and screamed. The devastation surpassed anything unleashed by his brothers. Reality split open, seared from its foundation by the release of physics-defying warp harmonics. Eidolon had grown since his resurrection, his might augmented to match his ancient arrogance. The brutal shockwave tore out, driving a path of annihilation through whatever stood in its way, bisecting the hulls of standard tanks, cracking armor, smashing skulls, and bursting blood vessels. The entire deck level reeled, casting warriors from their feet and causing grav speeders to plow into the plunging metal. 
Palls of smoke swelled up from the carnage, underlit with racing fires and shredded by follow-up blasts. So before we move into the next section of this video, I feel like I should address the sonic elephant in the room when it comes to noise marine weaponry. And that's their ridiculous and absolutely amazing guitar weapons that you see them wielding in most of the artwork. Now, admittedly, most of this artwork is fan art and it's a weird subject. So to get to the bottom of this, we're going to have to take a step back out of the lore and look at games workshops and thus Warhammer's real world history. The first iteration of the Noise Marine was created by artist Jess Goodwin back in the 80s, and in this earliest rendition of Warhammer, back when it was known as Rogue Trader, the Noise Marine was more of a novelty rather than a well-defined unit with a rich and well-thought-out history. It wouldn't be until 2nd edition Rogue Trader, which at that point in time became officially known as Warhammer 40,000, that the Noise Marines would get their first update and become a fully playable unit. Warhammer has its roots in satire, and I can fully see this earliest pitch of what a noise marine should be, taking the form of a ludicrously dressed space marine doing their best hair rocker impression and wielding a guitar as their primary weapon. It's a badass concept, everybody loved it, it was perfect, and in my opinion, it didn't need to change. But the rumor is that this early concept for the noise marines and thus their weaponry was seen as being too rooted in the real world, and the artists wanted to give it that grimdark treatment, really take that initial pitch and turn it into something we would expect to see in the 41st millennium. Thus, a space marine dressed up like a hair metal rocker turned into a depraved and mutated marine with Vox speakers for a mouth and amplifiers all over their shoulders. Whereas the guitar itself became more alien, demonic, and was something that was clearly meant to be a weapon, while still maintaining some of those classically defined instrument-like features. Honestly, the change to their weapons stands as a really good example of the overall grim darkening of the setting as we moved from the carefree early days of Warhammer into its more modern interpretation. However, if you want my more meta take on it, I'm pretty confident the shift in design is strongly correlated with musical tastes and aesthetics changing in the real world. Remember, when they were first designed in the 80s, this was the peak of glam metal's popularity. Thus, it makes sense that that aesthetic would have served as a source of inspiration to the artists. Then, as glam metal started to die off and we moved into the 90s, 2000s, 2010s, and beyond, the coked up big hair rocker motif would gradually give way to a more electronic, dubstepy DJ slash raver inspired aesthetic. However, as we move through yet another cycle of nostalgia, large sections of the fan base have been feeling pretty nostalgic for those early days, and it wouldn't take Games Workshop long to notice. Ladies and gentlemen, the moment we've all been waiting for, the noise my rain. In December of 2018, Games Workshop would end up bringing the classic Noise Marine back with a limited edition kit. And I just gotta say, this is by far one of my favorite models that Games Workshop has ever produced. And I know I'm not alone in that, as a lot of old school Warhammer fans and newcomers alike really wish they would bring back the classic guitar-shaped Sonic Blasters. Considering that this model ended up selling really well, and in the recently released Magic the Gathering Commander decks, the Noise Marine card is depicting a Noise Marine using the old school guitar Sonic Blaster, which, side note, I'm pretty confident this is the only official artwork depicting Sonic Blasters that look like this that's come out in multiple decades. I'm pretty confident the people at Games Workshop are aware of the original design's popularity. Now, as of the time we're recording this video, we just got the complete overhaul of the World Eaters last year, and and the rumor is that the Emperor's children are next in line for the same treatment. So who knows, maybe Games Workshop will end up bringing the guitars back. I, for one, certainly hope that they do. Regardless of what form of weaponry the Noise Marine chooses to utilize or what role they play in the battlefield, facing such an abomination is a truly terrifying concept. But they weren't always like this. They weren't always these hedonistic noise addicts. As I mentioned previously, the Emperor's children were some of the most honorable Astartes that ever fought under the Emperor's banners. How did they fall so far? How did they become something so awful? It just, what the hell happened to them? Well, the origins of the Noise Marines can trace themselves back to the Horus Heresy, and although that's not very surprising as a pretty large amount of things involving Chaos Space Marines can, what you may not know is that their creation was due in part to a very unlikely person, a mortal woman, a remembrancer known as Bekwa Kinska. 
10,000 years ago, the Remembrancers were kind of like wartime journalists, mortal men and women that were sent to accompany the Space Marines during the Great Crusade. Their primary job was to document the Space Marines' journey and achievements, preserving them for future generations. The Emperor's children, being a legion that prided themselves on perfection in all things, and who were all trained artists, musicians, or poets in their own right, selected Remembrancers with particularly profound artistic ability, seeing the need for not just written reports of the Crusades' accomplishments, but also artistic expressions through painting, sculpture, theater, or, in the case of Bekwa Kinska, music. Bekwa herself was a former child prodigy that was born in the hives of Europa. She would eventually travel to Terra and train within its academies, even at one point studying in the, at the time, newly established Conservatory de Musique. As a savant of music, there was little the professors were able to teach her that she didn't already know, and by the time she was an adult, she was a woman with an enormous ego and an incredibly high opinion of herself. But, in fairness, this was well-deserved, as she was extremely successful and talented. She was somebody that the Primarch Fulgrim himself, a demigod and perfection-given form, was particularly impressed by. She claimed that she wasn't at all surprised when the request came for her to accompany the Phoenician and his Emperor's children, and she was all too happy to go. By this point, she believed Terra had nothing left to offer her. She had sampled every carnal and narcotic pleasure that her money could buy, and everything had grown stale. The idea of setting off to explore the galaxy was something new and intriguing. And for a long time, everything was. It was new and wondrous, and being surrounded by other Remembrancers, each an insanely talented artist in their own right, was an exhilarating experience. But soon that too grew stale, and she found herself night after night sitting at her writing desk struggling to produce new music. The symphonies that had flowed so effortlessly from her fingertips before just refused to come. She hid her frustration well enough and kept up her air of arrogance, but this troubling development weighed deeply on her soul. This distressing bout of writer's block would eventually come to an end, for her and a group of other Remembrancers would end up being selected by the Astartes to journey down to the recently conquered world of Larian Surface to document the Emperor's children's recent victory. This is where she would enter the fated Temple of the Lair, where everything would change, and Bekwakinska, as well as the entirety of the Third Legion, would take its first steps towards damnation. In truth, the temple had already been secured by the Emperor's children in the previous battle, and it is where Fulgrim found a particularly disturbing artifact known as the Lair Blade. One of the Marines in the novel Fulgrim tries to explain to another one who hadn't been there just how uncanny and bizarre the experience of entering the temple really was. It was unlike anything he had ever experienced, and as disturbing as the trip had been, he continuously found himself finding reasons to go back accompanying the Remembrancers for protection being one such excuse. The snake-like Larian people had fought ferociously to defend the temple, and more so than any of their other settlements. It was like it wasn't just a place of worship to them, more like they were enthralled to it. The temple was a monument to excess. It was filled with intoxicating musks and aromas that ignited the senses, blazing lights and colors that leapt from wall to wall, and riotous noise that echoed in deafening thunder. The lair inside didn't even fight back against the invading marines. Hell, it was like they barely even noticed them. They were too fixated on their undulating hedonism. The interior of the temple was filled with monstrous bull-faced statues that the space marines assumed to have been the lair's gods. And the entire act of just being there, existing inside of this impossible place, was a profoundly exhilarating and disturbing experience. It was like the temple was more than just a construct of stone and polished marble. It was like it was alive. Later on, when Bekwa and the other Remembrancers were permitted to enter, she found herself moved to tears by the experience. The noise of the temple to her was like a symphony unlike any music in existence. She was completely in the throes of rapture by it, and had experienced a sudden, jarring spiritual awakening. Through tear-filled eyes, she turned to the Primarch and told him that she would recreate it, that she would distill its essence into something beautiful, a masterpiece in his name. Over the next several months, Bekwa would spend every waking moment frantically trying to recreate the sounds of the temple. She seemed wild and unkept, a far cry from the arrogant and boastful composer the Remembrancers had grown to know. Her peers documented that she was smiling while she worked, but there was clearly something manic about her frantic scribbling. 
The mania that had begun to sink its roots into her was not a unique experience, as all of the other remembrancers that had visited the temple were experiencing something similar. Their works that were once so tasteful and classically beautiful had become lewd and obscene. One artist went as far in their pursuit of replicating the impossible colors they witnessed inside of the temple to using their own blood mixed in their pigments. And when that ceased to have the desired effect, she started stalking and murdering the other crew members aboard the ship in order to use their bodily fluids on her canvas. When Bequa finally perfected her work, she organized a grand performance for all aboard the flagship known as Bequakinska's Maraviglia. In order to truly capture the essence of the Lair Temple, she designed a host of new instruments for the performers to use, designs that came to her in the fever dreams of her mania. They were frankly frightening to look at and resembled the Space Marines' bolt weapons more so than any orchestral instrument. They were monstrously oversized, covered in horns that resembled missile tubes, and had bizarrely crafted stringed mechanisms with long necks like a rifle. The remembrancers that were to assist in the performance spent many days and nights rehearsing and preparing La Fenice, the area of the ship dedicated to the remembrancers that took the form of a massive repurposed theater, embellishing it with lavish decor. It was kind of like watching a bunch of highly creative maniacs put on a show. Every frantic bout of creativity any one of them had was immediately implemented, and even Fulgrim himself spent a great amount of time in this area of the ship offering his insight. Eventually, the night of the performance came and the theater filled with Space Marines, Remembrancers, accompanying nobles, and crew men and women from all over. And nearly the entire population of the ship was in attendance, including the Primarch himself. This is a passage from the novel Fulgrim that covers the concert in great detail. It's told through the eyes of Julius, the first captain of the Emperor's children, and a man who deeply appreciated music. I'll let you know ahead of time, I'm not going to be showing any graphic imagery, but this entire section of the book was particularly disturbing. Julius felt himself carried on a journey of the senses as the music rose and fell. Emotions he had never experienced plucked from the depths of his soul and brought joyously to the fore as the crashing beats and wild, skirling tunes wound their way through the audience. He wanted to laugh and then cry, and then he felt a terrible anger build before it bled away and a great melancholy settled upon him. Within moments, the music had torn that loose, and a soaring elation asserted itself with the utmost lucidity and force, as though all that had gone before was merely the prelude to some grand design yet to be unveiled. Bekwakinska thrashed like a lunatic atop her conductor's podium, jabbing and slashing the air with her baton, her hair a wild comet of blue as it whipped around her head. Julius tore his eyes from the magnificent sight of her and looked out over the audience to witness its reaction to this sublime, raucous music. He saw faces wrapped in stunned disbelief, eyes wide as the power and majesty of the dissonant sounds penetrated every skull and spoke to every soul of the sensations evoked. But not every member of the audience appeared to appreciate the wonder of what they were privileged to witness, and Julia saw many with their hands clamped over their ears in the throes of agony as the music swelled once more. Julius caught the sight of the slender figure of Evander Tobias in the audience, and his anger grew as he watched the ungrateful wretch lead a group of his fellow scriveners through the crowd towards the exit. Scuffles broke out, and the recalcitrant archivist and his fellows were attacked, fist pummeling them to the ground where they were kicked and beaten. Without a pause, the audience returned its attention to the stage, and Julius felt a fierce pride swell in his breast as he watched a heavy boot crunch down on Tobias' skull. None remarked upon the sudden bloody violence, as if it had been the most natural reaction, but Julius could see the bloodlust spread through the audience like a virus or the shockwave of a detonation. The music swept onward, rising and sweeping around La Fenice like a whirlwind, until at last it reached the thunderous crescendo of its climax, whereupon the curtain rose in a flurry of dramatic and spectacular sensations. The interior of the Lair Temple had been recreated in painstaking detail, its eye-watering colors and dimensions faithfully recreated by the artists and sculptors who had walked within its magnificence. Vivid lights flashed around the theater, and Julius felt a momentary disorientation as more music blasted from the orchestra, a new piece with darker overtones and an aching sense of imminent tragedy. The effect was immediately obvious, and a shudder of pleasure rippled through the audience as the powerful notes flowed into and through them. 
Julius forced himself to look away from the stage, enthralled and terrified by what he was seeing and hearing. What manner of being could hear music of such terrible power and retain his sanity? Man was not meant to listen to this, the birthing cry of a beautiful and terrible god, as it forced its way into existence. Eidolon and Marius were as ensnared by the spectacle of the Maraviglia as he was, pinned to their seats in rapture. The jaws of both warriors were locked open, as though they entertained the idea of joining with Coraline in song. But there was panic in their eyes, as their mouths stretched wide in silent screams, bones cracking as they distended like a snake about to devour its prey. Hideous, soundless shrieks issued from their throats, and Julius forced himself to look at Fulgrim for fear that he might strike down his friends in his fugue state. Fulgrim gripped the edge of the Phoenician's nest, leaning forward as though forcing passage through a powerful wind. His hair writhed around his head, and his dark eyes burned with a violet fire as he reveled in the cacophony. What is happening? cried Julius, his voice swept up and becoming part of the music. Fulgrim turned his dark eyes upon him, and Julius cried out as he saw an age of darkness within them, galaxies and stars wheeling in their depths as unknown power flowed through him. It's beautiful said Fulgrim, his voice barely above a whisper, but sounding deafening to Julius as he propelled himself from his seat and fell to his knees at the edge of the box. Horus spoke of power, but I, I never imagined. Julius watched in wonder, realizing that he could actually see the soprano's music as it reached out into the audience and slithered amongst them like a living thing. Their shrieks and cries penetrated the fog of music that writhed in his brain and he saw all manner of horrors enacted throughout the audience, as friends turned and fought each other with fist and teeth. Some audience members fell upon one another with a carnal lust, and the heaving crowd soon resembled a great wounded beast, convulsing in agonized throes of death and desire. Nor was it simply the mortals who were affected. The Astartes, too, were swept up in the surging power generated by the Maraviglia. Blood was spilled as the emotions of the Astartes were overloaded with sensational excess, and were vented in the only way men bred as warriors knew how. An orgy of killing spread from the stage, blood running in rivers as the power of the music thundered through La Fenice. Lights blazed around the theater, flowing from the orchestra pit like liquid, the greasy electrical fire lifting from the bizarre instruments and achieving physicality as they became liquid serpents of myriad colors. Madness and excess followed the light, and all those it touched gave themselves over to the wildest, darkest delights of their inner psyches. The orchestra played as though their limbs were not their own, their faces twisted in horrified rictus masks, and their hands frenziedly dancing across their instruments with violent life. The music held them in its grip, and it was not about to let any weakness on the part of its creators deny its existence. Julius heard notes of agony enter Coraline's voice and managed to lift his eyes to the stage where the prima donna danced in a wild, exuberant ballet as the choirster screamed an unnatural counterpoint. Her limbs snapped and twisted in a manner that no human limb was designed to, and he could hear the cracking of her bones as it became part of the million melodies filling the theater. He could see that she was dead, her eyes lifeless, every bone in her body turned to powder. And yet the song poured from her still. The madness and frenzy engulfing La Fenice soared to new heights of excess as all flesh was infected with the maelstrom of sights and sounds coming from the stage. Julius watched as the Astartes clubbed mortals to death with their fists and drank their blood or ate their flesh, scarring their skin with the broken bones and draping the torn skin of their victims about them like grisly shawls. Vast orgies of mortals shuddered on the blood-slick paraquet as the living and the dead became vessels for the dark energies pouring into the world, every violation imaginable, willingly inflicted. At the center of the madness, Bekwa Kinska conducted the chaos with a delirious smile of triumph plastered across her face. Eventually, the unspeakable debauchery within the theater reaches a breaking point and rips a hole between universes. Demonettes of Slanesh begin to materialize within the theater, inside of and reanimating the corpses of the dead. They slaughter the rest of the musicians, including Bekwa herself, before loosing themselves into the audience. Without anyone to play the instruments, the music dies, but the theater is anything but silent. Thousands of screaming voices combined with lewd sounds of debauchery and violence fill the air, as well as the cries of anguish from the audience members over the sudden void the departure of the music has left behind. 
One of the Space Marines can't bear the silence anymore, so he rushes onto the stage, frantically picking up one of the instruments and desperately trying to play it. And more of the Emperor's children follow suit. They lack the skills needed to produce the symphony from before, but they quickly find the power within the devices as every strum of their chords unleashes a howling, shrieking blast of energy that detonates against the walls, tearing the theater apart. They laugh like hedonistic maniacs, and one by one, they heft their weapons and point them at the audience. These marines that had stormed the stage would end up keeping these weapons and would become the very first noise marines. And although the Night of the Maraviglia was technically when we saw the noise marines first appear, their inception had actually begun several years prior. As in their pursuit of perfection, the apothecaries of the Emperor's children had experimented with their own host of gene-enhancing procedures, and through this, a culture of surgical augmentation had begun to develop within the Legion. This began with Fabius Bile, the chief apothecary, and was done out of necessity, as the Emperor's children were afflicted with a form of super cancer that had been decimating the Legion. Even once it had been thought mostly brought under control, surgical purity tests to make sure it didn't come back were commonplace amongst the Legionnaires. However, over time, these surgeries began to take on a more augmentary role. Whether that take the form of additional grafts of synthetic muscles, concealed augmented senses, or even surgical alterations to the brain that were far removed from the Emperor-ordained pattern set for Legion Astartes. Most of these enhancements were derived from Zeno's technology and designed by Fabius Bile himself, and were eventually fully embraced by the Legion. After the dreaded concert, even the fleeting limitations that the Legion had set in place were thrown out the window. The surgeries became ever more extreme, allowing the Emperor's children to experience sensation on ridiculous new levels. In addition to this, after the Night of the Maraviglia, sonic cults began to spread throughout the Legion. They were similar in purpose to the lodges utilized by other legions, but were noted for being a lot more unorganized and functioned as a gathering to embrace excess. Potentially the most important noise marine of these early days was none other than Marius Verosin, the first space marine to storm the stage that night and pick up one of Bequa's dreaded instruments. Before corruption had taken hold of the Legion, Marius was a warrior that had been known as famously rigid, a lover of discipline, formality, and hierarchy. Now, however, he had become a deranged psychopath that wore the skins of the victims of the concert from spikes on his armor, a man who had sliced off his own ears and whose lower jaw was unhinged like a snake and pulled back in a permanent rictus smile. He and the other Marines that claimed these weapons were organized into a new unit known as the Cacophony. And their first documented deployment was during the Dropsite Massacre, although at this point in time, they were not really a disciplined fighting force, and based on the account presented in the novel Fulgrim, it's as if they brought these experimental weapons to battle because it seemed like it would be a fun thing to do. These weapons were untuned and unpredictable, and presented a threat not just to the target, but to the wielder as well. Additionally, although mutation had taken root within the Emperor's children and was slowly starting to change them, the wielders of Bequa's instruments had the process of corruption greatly accelerated because of their constant exposure to the warping energies that their new weapons emanated. In the first half of this video, we discussed pretty extensively what the Noise Marines are all about in the 41st and 42nd millennium. But there's one final thing that I think is important for us to discuss to really get a better understanding of what they're all about, and that is the concept of the song. Across all of the different Noise Marines and the stories they pop up in, the idea of the song is a very prominent theme, an eternal quest for the perfect symphony in which to honor Slaanesh. But what exactly is the song? What is its purpose, and why are they so obsessed with it? Although there isn't a lot of concrete information on what the song is, we do have a few good quotes from the Fabius Bile trilogy that give us a little bit more insight into its nature. The first one comes from a noise marine known as Ramos. The song, begun on the day of the Dark Prince's conception and sung continuously by select choirs ever since, the Eldari had begun the song, and their ghosts still sang it in the depths of the webway. But Ramos and his brothers had their parts as well. They added their voices to those of the dead, the lost, and the damned throughout the continuum of time. A universal choir, all singing in harmony with one another across the vast gulfs of existence, backwards and forwards. Singing the Dark Prince into existence at the beginning, singing to ensure that he had always existed and would always exist at the end. They sang so the sun might rise and always have risen. Without the song, Slanesh might cease to be. 
and without Slanesh, the song would never have been. Ramos could not conceive of such an absence, and his mind shied away from the enormity of it. Without the song, he would never have cracked the lunar gate. Without the song, Fulgrim would never have picked up the Lair Blade. The next passage I want to share with you actually comes from the first book in the Fabius Bile trilogy, wherein we see Fabius go to acquire the assistance of a group of noise marines for an upcoming assault on an Eldar craft world. To Fabius' surprise, he recognizes many of them, individuals that he had personally augmented during the Horus Heresy. And it's kind of a bittersweet reunion, because as evil as Fabius Bile is, he does have this paternal affection for all of his creations, these noise marines included. Only a noise marine would think such shrieking was a song. The song, the only song, Slanesh's song, the birth song, the death song. We seek its notes in the black, the perfect note. You gave me a voice, Chief Apothecary. For that, I thank you. The other noise marines raised their instruments and loosed a melancholy wail. The song of Slanesh calls to us, and we to it, but we cannot reach it. Do you hear the song, Chief Apothecary? It is so beautiful. It shakes the roots of all that is and makes gods weep in desperation. It is a birth song and a death song. It is the song whose melody lulls sons to eternal slumber and whose reverberations crack the crust of a thousand moons. We can perceive it but dimly, and it hurts us so. So let's talk a bit about this, and I want to start by saying that I do firmly believe that the Song of Slanesh is a real thing, a psychic resonance that the Noise Marines are capable of perceiving in-universe, something that began with the Eldari, and whose legacy is upheld by the Noise Marines, but I think there's more to it than that. On one hand, I believe the song exists as a literary metaphor for excess, obsession, and addiction. In a sense, it's a metaphor for Slanesh themselves. The Song of Slanesh is Slanesh. Every one of the infinite notes and chords within the song has a correlating addiction in the physical universe, all weaving together to give birth to and maintain the Chaos God of Excess. One of these notes, and it's a very important one to the story of the Emperor's children and the Noise Marines, is the complete obsession with being perfect, and the damage that path can do to us both physically, mentally, and spiritually. So I want to talk a bit more about that here, but know going into this next section that you could honestly replace the pursuit of perfection with any other obsession or addiction, as they all exist as lyrics within the Song of Slanesh. Let me start this by saying that there is a fundamental difference between trying to improve in any given category or subject and the obsession with perfection. Perfection doesn't exist, it isn't real, it is a myth, it is an idealized state that has the potential only to limit us by believing in it. We have no idea what perfection even looks like, we can only tell what it is not by pointing out the flaws in things that are objectively not perfect. Yet, despite this, perfection is something that many will endlessly pursue to their own detriment. Additionally, to me, the constant seeking out of new notes, symphonies, and melodies to add to the song is much like how people who seek perfection in real life are never able to achieve it. They're only able to add a little bit more to what it might possibly be. Perfection is something that is built upon the foundation of those who came before, never to be realized by those in the present, and will continue to be sought after endlessly by all those to come in the future. The Noise Marines also mention that their dim perception of the song is hurting them, but they can't stop, they have to keep going, much like how an artist in pursuit of perfection may not be able to see the beauty and value of their creations as they can only fixate on what is wrong with them. Thus, they are propelled down an endless spiral, chasing after perfection to the detriment of their own mental and often physical well-being. And speaking of the pursuit of perfection, there's actually a really interesting moment in the novel Fulgrim that takes place after he has given himself over to Slanesh, even if he doesn't fully realize that that's what's happened yet. In this scene, he has become jealous of the talents of one of the Remembrancers and tries to craft the perfect sculpture. And by all accounts, he succeeds. The marble statue is perfect. It's absolutely flawless in every way. It's so perfect and so flawless that it's soulless. The flaws were what made the work interesting and meaningful in the first place. The chip in the marble where the sculptor got too overzealous with their chiseling. The odd section where they messed up and had to work around a piece that broke off. 
incorporating the flaw itself into the work. These are the elements that created the story of the work, gave it meaning, and in a sense, brought it to life. What Fulgrim had created was alien and cold, and completely lifeless. It was objectively beautiful. It was so perfect that the Remembrancer that Fulgrim had fully anticipated would be blown away and left awestruck was instead left deeply disturbed by it. The noise marines Fulgrim and the other Emperor's children wear the scars of the pursuit of perfection on their sleeves. They become monstrous and deranged. One can see the damage that has been done to them through their obsession with just their eyes. It's really not a subtle metaphor at all. What we mortals may consider to be the perfect ballad, something by Bach or Beethoven or any other famous composer, is so beneath the noise marine, so utterly flawed and imperfect, that they can't even perceive it. And much like how Fabius says only a noise marine could consider that noise music, what they deem as perfect is much like Fulgrim's statue. Perfection is a goalpost that can never be truly reached. Whenever we get close to it, it moves further and further away. The Emperor's children of the Great Crusade, once noble and proud warriors that were on the path of pursuing perfection, but took moments to appreciate just how far they had come, would be horrified by what they are in the 42nd millennium. Their gross, mutated forms, existing as an on-the-nose metaphor for what obsessively pursuing perfection to the detriment of all else really looks like. It is a path that led them into damnation. It twisted and contorted them physically, mentally, and spiritually. And in this, the pursuit of perfection can be just as corrupting as rot, rage, treachery, or any of the other tools the ruinous powers utilize in their great game. It's honestly really sad when you stop to think about what's happened to them. As long as there are mouths willing to sing, as long as excess is practiced at some point in time or space, then Slanesh will continue to exist. The song will continue to be played. If it wasn't made apparent throughout the course of this video, the Noise Marines are by far one of my favorite units in all of 40k. There's something just so deliciously extra about them. They're unapologetically over the top, almost cartoonish in their extremes. They're Chaos Space Marine drug addicts that kill their enemies with the power of rock. And I think even if you aren't a fan of Chaos in this setting, you can at least appreciate just how awesome these dudes are. That being said, on the other end of the spectrum, I find their story deeply depressing. They were once the pinnacle of creation, the Emperor's children, noble warriors that thought not only to be perfect in combat, but saw beauty and worth in all things. Space Marines were created to be soldiers. They are as much a tool as the bolters they wield. But the Emperor's children were different. They appreciated art, music, poetry, and the other creative pursuits of mankind that the strength of humanity was not just in its military might, but in the beauty it was capable of creating. There's something incredibly admirable about that to me. It would be impossible to perceive just how far they would sink into depravity. Their never-ending quest for perfection dragged them down kicking and screaming as they sank deeper and deeper into an ocean of excess. The Noise Marines have done horrible, unspeakable things, and there can be no redemption for them, no rehabilitation, and no forgiveness. Their existence is a torturous one, one in which nothing will ever be enough. Their minds are so fractured, all of their senses so fried, that the worst, most horrific sensations of pain, misery, and suffering are the only thing that allows them to feel anything anymore. The only thing that reminds them that they're still alive that they exist. None of that matters, for they know what their purpose truly is, and why they continue to cling to what the ignorant would see as a meaningless, hedonistic existence. They are the divine instruments of Slanesh, the choir masters and conductors of the universe, the voice of chaos itself. So long as they draw breath, as long as they continue on their never-ending pursuit of perfection, no matter how much it hurts them, they will continue to give voice to the voiceless, form to the formless, and meaning to the divine symphony of the universe. They will continue to sing the song of birth and death, of creation and destruction, the song of Slanesh. At least, this is what they have deluded themselves into believing. I want to close this video out with one final passage from Primogenitor, a scene that, after I read it, I couldn't stop thinking about it for weeks. 
The noise marine that we spoke about earlier in the video, the one who Fabius recognized and who told him of the song, has signed up for a mission that only he can accomplish. But he knows it will be the end of him. He willingly sacrifices himself, allowing his body to be plugged directly into the heart of their ship in order to turn the entire vessel into an amplification device for his song. He does this in order to protect everyone within the fleet, his singing masking their presence as they move in to attack an Eldar craft world. The act is ultimately successful, and his singing so intense and beautiful that it even manages to draw an entire choir of demonettes to his side that add their voice to his song. These were his final moments, as the flames at the heart of the ship began to consume him. His brothers would stride forth, their instruments raised, and carry the song into the very heart of the enemy. They would make the very Wraithbone weep for the beauty of it, and they would teach the faithless Eldar new ways to shout and revel and kill. His part in the song was coming to an end, but it would never die. He would go out like a light, but the song would roll on, gaining in strength. It would envelop the galaxy, and all would know the divine joys of Slanesh's favor. A kernel of pain flared within him, growing stronger. His singing began to falter. He was truly alone now beyond all redemption and recrimination. Armor plates peeled away from his disintegrating limbs, his cracking torso, his deflating skull. The demonettes faded away, trailing their claws across his armor in bittersweet farewell, or perhaps in acknowledgement of a life well lived and a song well sung. Elian Pacrides, once a sergeant of the Ninth Company, crumbled away as the war began, but the song of destruction rolled on, only growing stronger.